why I love all the discussion in here. It's just sweet for me to hear your voices. And you are delighting in having conversation with each other, and I just praise the Lord for the deep sense of fellowship and community that there is in this room. So, welcome back to James. And uh, have you ever been on a road trip and you suddenly look up, maybe from reading a book, and you wonder, where are we? <laughs> And I thought that might, might be the way you feel when you hit James at this point. Uh, you wonder, now where are we in relation to where we started, and where are we in relation to where we're going, our destination, so where are we on our journey through James? So when Brian Tab opened our study up with a preview night, he introduced this letter. He gave us a copy of an outline by a scholar by the name of Craig Blomberg. And you have that outline on your handout. It's on the flip side. You'll see that James uses three themes that pop up repeatedly, and each time that he circles back to one of those themes, he unpacks more for us to learn. And so I've underlined one of those themes, that is riches and poverty. And we first saw this back in James chapter 1, verse 9, where James said, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. And then last week when Amy taught, we saw that a mark of pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is mercy toward the afflicted. And just a little reminder I'm going to throw in here that remember that the chapter breaks that you see in your Bibles are not inspired. All right, So they often flow from one chapter into the next. So think of verse 27 from chapter 1 just flowing right into chapter 2 here, where James called us in, in verse 127 to call us to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And so this focus on showing mercy to the vulnerable and the suffering is a thread that runs throughout the Bible. It reflects the very heart of God himself. It's what healthy gospel churches should look like versus the example that James is going to give us here in chapter 2. At the heart of the gospel is God's life-giving mercy to the undeserving. In your lesson this week, you read 2 Corinthians um, 8, verse 9, that says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And I think when the truth, this tremendous truth, really grips our hearts, we extend mercy and love to those we meet around us as well. Paul describes our life in Christ as, in Galatians 5, 6, he says this way, as faith working through love. The theme that we see now throughout James 2 is that true biblical faith is living. It's not dead. And it will be evidenced by love in verses 1 through 13, and then by works in verses 14 and following that Sharice is going to teach on next week. Faith is not mere intellectual assent, but it's a heart that is trusting and treasuring Jesus, and it overflows into loving action that reflects his character. So would you pray with me now as we dig into James 2? <coughs> Lord, I pray that you would help us to see and to understand, to hear and to do, and to know that true, consistent, biblical faith is evidenced by loving each other the way you have loved us. Thank you for your rich love that you demonstrated for us in Jesus. And I pray that you would now walk us through this chapter with your Spirit's help so that we can see and understand the beautiful things that you have for us here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, when we lived in southern Minnesota, we were part of a teeny tiny little church plant. The kind of tiny church that... If a visitor walked in, everybody would just descend on them like vultures. <laughs> Visitors did not go unnoticed. But this particular Sunday morning, it was just a normal Sunday morning. We were all settled in, getting ready to hear the sermon, when all of a sudden a visitor walked in. And this visitor was, this man was all alone, he was dirty, he smelled, and he was dressed in very tattered clothes. We assumed that he was homeless. And after sitting quietly, for a while, slumped in the back row with nervous ushers looking at him, wondering, you know, what, what, what they should do, how they could help him. He walked down the aisle, the center aisle, to the pastor, and he turned around and he began an angry rant. 
And he told us that after a week of unsuccessfully looking for a job and sleeping on the street, he was just at his wit's end. He thought, you know, he was just very angry and upset. And he says, you love Jesus? Yeah, right. And the more angry he got, the more I think the rest of us were feeling very uncomfortable in our seats. And some were planning their exit route, uh, where to hide if things got ugly. Uh, one of the elders walked over to the man and started engaging him in conversation. And the rest of us prayed for the Lord's grace to help us interact well with this man. And after what seemed like an eternity, our senior pastor broke his silence and he introduced us to his good friend, who was a good friend from seminary, who he had asked to come and dress up and play this part to see how we would react. <clears throat> it, met, it met with mixed reviews. <laughs> Now, this might sound familiar because this is actually a scene from a book that was written in the 1800s, actually 1896, and it became an, a, a bestseller in terms of you know, religious books, um, and it's called In His Steps. And some of you might know the full title. Does anybody know the full title? It was popular in the 90s. In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? Does that sound familiar now? Yeah. Remember the bracelets and everything. Well, James saw a problem in the church, and so he called out the sin of partiality. He gives us a warning here in verse 1. And here's our... The main idea that we have here this morning is that true, consistent biblical faith is evidenced by loving as God loves. Partiality is inconsistent with the example of Jesus. It's inconsistent with the grace of God, and it's inconsistent with the command to love. And so the first thing we see here is the warning. He says in verse 1, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Now this word partiality, or prejudiced favoritism, is one of the most technicolor words in the New Testament, according to one source. It translates a compound Greek word that means literally to receive or lift up the face or to receive someone according to their face. This means to make quick judgments and distinctions based on external considerations such as physical appearance, social status, education, economic position, or race. God does not show partiality, and we are to be like him. Now in the Old Testament, Moses reminded the Israelites that the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. That's Deuteronomy 10. And then in Leviticus 19 we read, You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. And then in Leviticus 19, it goes on to verse 18, which says, But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And that's the passage that James references later on in this passage in verse 8. So this imperative, do not show partiality, is for us, for those of us who hold to the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the same as the Old Testament demand. Now, in the New Testament, Paul is very clear on why we should not show favoritism. He says, for God shows no partiality in Romans 2.11. Or Ephesians 6.9, which says, there is no partiality with him. Peter learned this truth when he went and he was commanded to go to the house of Cornelius. Remember, who was a Gentile, and Peter was a Jew. And in Acts 10, Peter says this, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. A modern paraphrase, paraphrase of verse 1 is, Are you really trying to combine faith in Jesus Christ, our glorified Lord, with the worship of rank? Faith and favoritism are mutually exclusive. I'd like to read a quote from David Gibson's book, Radically Whole, Gospel Healing for the Divided Heart. 
He said this, here's how this passage works. You confess the faith, you are true believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, and so you say you're following the Lord of glory, but you act like you believe in glorious people. You say you believe in Jesus' glory, but it's clear that your heads are so easily turned by human glory. You are looking at Jesus, but in comes the money man, and see, you drop your gaze, you turn your head, and as you do so, you show the kind of glory your heart really loves. Treating a person differently based on their external experience is inconsistent with faith in our Lord Jesus, who came to break down the walls of nationality, of race, of social class, gender, and religion. In Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. That's Colossians 3. <coughs> Jesus, the Lord of glory, demonstrated his upside-down kingdom. So true, consistent, <coughs> biblical faith is evidenced by loving as God loves. Partiality is inconsistent with the example of Jesus. So evidence of true faith is acting in love toward others. How do we demonstrate love for others? Well, we could start by treating them as made in the image of God and persons for whom Jesus died. Now James goes on to give us an example in verses 2 through 4. This is an illustration to drive home the point. He cites a hypothetical example of the kind of problem that might have actually existed in the church there. Let's read it. For a man, if a man is wearing a gold ring and fine clothing and comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So here is one who comes in sporting marks of the wealthy, all dressed up. One commentator said that there were even shops in Rome where you could go and you could rent gold rings, because if you really wanted to appear wealthy, you would have a gold ring on each finger. And so in comes this filthy, tattered, you know, clothing man, because that's all he's got, right? To show partiality means that we care more about that outward appearance than we do about the heart. I think we're prone to look at someone's face, their clothes, their speech, their hairstyle, their jewelry, or their lack of jewelry. We could go on and on, right, of outward characteristics. But 1 Samuel 16 says, The Lord sees not as man sees. Man sees on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So God looks at the heart, and he cares deeply about what is on the inside. But we can't see a person's heart, can we? But we can be discerning, and we can see the fruit of faith in their lives? Are their actions consistent with their words? Those are the kinds of things that we can look at when we see someone. To show partiality shows that we misunderstand who is important and blessed in the sight of God. If we value material wealth, we'll assume that the rich man is more important to God or more blessed by God. We classify people in our minds. James says that's evil thoughts. And we make false assumptions based on their appearance. We are not to look down at other people or have a holier-than-thou kind of attitude. Here at the North Church, it, maybe it's not what we wear that separates people, but maybe what we perceive as their view on certain issues. Or you could think of other things. To show partial, partiality also demonstrates our selfishness, thinking that we can get favors from the rich man that we couldn't get from the poor man. Partiality for any reason is a sin. Judging, condemning some and preferring others is not compatible with true faith. It drives wedges between people. Blomberg wrote this. He said, when we attempt to discern people's value based on external features, we not only try to usurp God's role as judge, but we fail miserably in the process. Sinful behavior comes from sinful motives or thoughts. On the other hand, when we have the mind of Christ, we will see others from his perspective and will treat them with love. James goes on here now. He says, listen, my beloved brothers. 
<coughs> pay attention. So I want to have a, make a statement here that James is not making broad kind of blanket statements concerning whole broad groups of people. He's not saying that all poor people will be saved. He's not saying that all rich people will be condemned. James is writing here to a specific group of people at a specific time in a specific situation in which the rich were taking advantage of the poor and the church was giving the rich preferential treatment. Now in the Old Testament, God condemns oppression or neglect of the poor because he values all people. God has chosen people from every tribe and tongue and nation and people, rich and poor, wealthy and lowly. And the Bible is full of God's care for the weak, the helpless, the marginalized. God hears the cries for help, and he sees the unseen. One of my favorite verses from our study in Exodus was at the end of Exodus 2. Do you remember? Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard the groaning, and God remembered his covenant. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Well, true, consistent, biblical faith is evidenced by loving as God loves. Partiality is inconsistent with the example of Jesus. It's inconsistent with the grace of God. Now James goes on to list three reasons why partiality or favoritism or discrimination is sinful. And he does this by framing it with rhetorical questions. Now as a reminder, James' original audience was made up primarily of the socioeconomically poor who were on the receiving end of oppression from their community, those unbelieving rich people in their community. So sadly, they've not responded as Jesus would. So he gives three reasons. The first reason is that favoritism is inconsistent with God's choice of the poor. He says this in verse 5 and 6a. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? that term there. Now, though it might not be easy for us, or it might be easy for us to be partial to the rich, God isn't. In fact, riches can often be an obstacle to the kingdom of God. Do you remember Jesus had a conversation with a rich young ruler? And he said, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So preferential treatment of the rich stands in stark contrast to the heart of God, who has chosen the poor to be rich in faith. And there's a sense in which God especially blesses the poor of this world. If we show favoritism, we're denying the truth of the gospel message, and, and it's disconnected from the character of God. So James says they are chosen to be rich in faith. I think one reason could be because the poor of this world simply have more opportunities to trust God. They turn to God as their only hope. Therefore, they may be far more rich in faith than the rich man. A flip side of this is we should remind ourselves that God also never calls for favoritism against the rich. A person's looks or economic status or whatever should not factor into any of our decisions or judgments. We will always be able to find someone who is richer than we are and someone who is poorer than we are. God is telling us not to favor and not to look down on others or to love everyone. Another sweet phrase here at the second half of verse 5 helps us to further understand the identity of these poor. God has also chosen them to be, do you see this? Heirs of the kingdom. This is a thread that we see throughout the Bible, going all the way back to Abraham in Genesis. In Matthew 19, Jesus said, Any, Everyone who has left houses, or brothers or sisters, or father or mother or children, or lands for my sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, 
and the last first. Jesus also said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then Paul writes in Romans 8, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And now the last phrase here, it says, which he has promised to those who love him. This identity of the poor, these are lovers of Jesus, ones who love him. We saw this two weeks ago in James 1.12, where the crown of life was promised to those who love him. There's a couple reasons um, here. I think I've lost my place. Here we go. We're going to go on to reason number two. Okay? Number two, favoritism is inconsistent with the conduct of the rich ones. We see this in verses six and seven. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Often it was the rich who were persecuting the early believers. They were taking advantage of them. Why? Do you remember what Paul told, Tim told Timothy? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Well, these these rich men may have dragged the poor into court to gain more land, to gain their property, or it could have been they wanted to sue for a debt that was owed to them. And then when the poor could not pay, they were thrown into prison. Apparently, instead of pursuing justice or speaking out against the actions of the rich, they showed honor to these rich and powerful, and they dishonored the poorer people. Note here that James is not saying that he's condemning the rich people for being rich. He's condemning them for their conduct. He goes on, he says, Are not these the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? They were slandering God, saying terrible, untrue things about his character or his people, or they were mocking God or the gospel. They were even persecuting these early believers, followers of Jesus. He goes on to give us reason number three. Favoritism is inconsistent with the royal law, the command to love. In verses 8 through 11, he says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as, your as yourself, you are doing well. Now James might have been anticipating an excuse here from his congregation. But James, the rich man is my neighbor. I'm just loving him as I would love myself. I'm just obeying the law. But James might reply, no, you might think that's a creative excuse, but if you show favoritism, you are committing sin. The problem isn't that you are nice to the rich. The problem is that you favor the rich and you're not loving the poor. The poor man is just as much our neighbor as the rich man is. So why is love thy neighbor called the royal law? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, it's given by God, who is our great king. His law is a royal law. God gave us this command, and Jesus reaffirmed it to us in John 13, among other places. And our king Jesus put special emphasis on this command in Matthew 22, when he referred back to the Old Testament in Leviticus 19.18, and said that he fulfilled the law. This royal law fulfills all other laws. Paul wrote to the Romans, love is the fulfilling of the law. I imagine there would be no need for a complicated set of laws if each person truly loved his neighbor. Now James goes on, he uses the word but here, which indicates that we have a contrast coming up. The opposite of the royal law is love. Or, the opposite of the royal law, love, is prejudiced favoritism or partiality. It's a contrast between doing well and committing sin. He goes on, he said, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So very clearly here, partiality or favoritism is sin. 
Unless we think that we can pick and choose which of God's commands we should obey and which ones we should ignore, James says, no, you break one, you've broken them all. He guards against selective obedience here, the sort where we would selfishly decide which commands of God should be obeyed and which we could safely disregard. Do we really love our neighbor? That really is a hollow claim if we are hypocritical and we show partiality. Now James goes on to close here. He's got a closing command. Be consistent. He says, so speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who is shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So look at the connections we have from last week here. Two key pieces of faithful living are, number one, how we speak, and number two, how we act, right? We are to be hearers of God's word and doers, and we're to be true to God's word. And then remember back in James 1.25, where he used that same term, one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed by his doing. Now last week, Amy reminded us how Jesus explained in the Sermon on the Mount that he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And not only that, he provides the spirit to bring truth to us and to bring understanding and also to give us the power to fulfill what he commands. So the law no longer just condemns us for our failure. It's now a law of liberty that leads to freedom and joy for us as we obey God's commands. Is our lives as true believers consistent with our position under the law of liberty and God's coming judgment? As those who will be judged under the law of liberty, we should show mercy to others by refraining from partiality, by not showing favoritism. Today's passage is about judging and how we sometimes judge versus how God judges. If we show partiality, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That was verse 4. If we show favoritism, We've used our law-breaking, non-love of our neighbor as our benchmark for judging others. And that is downright sinful. Ignoring God's law and deciding which people we are going to love. Jesus said again in the Sermon on the Mount, For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The mercy we show will be extended to us again on the day of judgment, and that mercy triumphs over judgment. So, you might ask, how does mercy triumph over judgment for the Christian? Well, those who never show any mercy have not truly understood and accepted God's mercy. If we are truly saved, our faith must include showing mercy toward others, and our merciful attitude and actions demonstrate that we are united with Christ. God's mercy only triumphs over his judgment for those who are in Christ. Those not in Christ will receive judgment, not mercy. Judgment and mercy met perfectly at Jesus in the cross. Mercy didn't triumph over judgment for Jesus, but he bore the wrath the judgment that was ours so he could pour out the mercy that we need so desperately. God will judge every person according to whether they are in Christ. Mercy for those who are found taking refuge in Jesus alone for salvation and judgment for those not, for those that are just trusting in themselves. So true, consistent, biblical faith is evidenced by Loving as God loves. Partiality is inconsistent with the example of Jesus. It's inconsistent with the grace of God. And it's inconsistent with the command to love. Look back at verse 2. You see that poor man with the shabby clothing? 
This is the same root word as back in James 1.21, if you want to look back there, where it's translated filthiness, which means dirty. That's a moral vileness. Like the man that walked into our church service years ago, perhaps this man smelled. The filth and the stench can make us want to run away in the opposite direction. I think what James wants us to realize is that we are all filthy. And it's not just on the outside, but it's on the inside. And here is the really amazing thing, that Jesus did not move away. He didn't say, go stand over there. He came to us. He came near while we were still sinners. He came to die for us, the filthy and the poor. He showed us no partiality. The good news of the gospel is that he made us, the poor in the world, to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. Now this royal law, the command to love our neighbor, was also perfectly fulfilled in Jesus. He came to earth, he became a man, he became our neighbor, and then he demonstrated that sacrificial love for us. He died for us, his neighbors, and we love others and we extend mercy because that is what Jesus gave us. So where do we start in applying James's main point? Well, partiality is a sin, which is especially dangerous in the church because it affects how we as believers function in relationship with each other. Do you make distinctions in the church? How are you loving as God loves? Who do you speak to here at Bible study? Or on a Sunday morning at church? Do you actively try to meet others and welcome them? Or sit in the same place with people that you already know? How can you extend love and mercy to visitors? Do you show hospitality to those who can't return it? You know, outside the church, there is a lot of discussion about these kinds of issues. Perhaps in your work workplace, you have had to attend DEI training, diversity, equity, inclusion. How do we navigate discussions in a culture where people can't even agree on terms? Or the definitions keep changing. Sisters, we need to aim to do our best to see people through the eyes of Jesus and to reach out in love as the Spirit leads. It can be intimidating to enter conversations. Perhaps you're afraid to say the wrong thing. You don't know all the answers to all the charges or statistics or the latest news reports. But you know, I remember about how a bank teller is trained not to know every detail about counterfeit because those bills are always changing, the kind of forging it can do. But she's trained to know the real thing. And like her, you're here at Bible study this morning and you're learning the truth, the truths that we can learn from James and all across the Bible about what God says about sin and about partiality. And so we're going to go through some of these truths as we close here. And I have those written out in your handout, so you can take them with you. Racism is a sin because it violates God's commands regarding impartiality, in judgment, and love for neighbor. This is uh, given for us in Exodus and Deuteronomy, throughout Leviticus, and in our passage here in James. This can be subtle, or it can be overt. It can be written into law, like it was in our country during the days of slavery and the Jim Crow laws, or it can just be in our hearts as individuals, and it can lead to sinful conduct. We all must examine our lives and ask if we are really loving as God loves. We can use the words to the hymn that we sang this morning. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Our primary identity is in Christ, and it's not in any of our outward characteristics. God created all people groups and ordained the times and the places that we would live. So it's not sinful to have an ethnic or a cultural identity. A dear sister reminded me that diversity is God's idea. He designed diversity into every part of his creation, but he designed diversity to exist in unity. 
Paul, he exulted in his Jewish ancestry. He referred to the Jews as his people. And he also notes how Jewish believers brought him comfort. And then there was Peter. We talked about him earlier, the example of showing up in the house of Cornelius and realizing that God, God does not show partiality. But what does Paul go on to say is his primary identity? He goes on to compare his various identities that he outlines in Philippians 3 as rubbish. He says this in Philippians 3. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So I challenge you to think of yourself as a Christian who is, and then fill in the blank with all of your other identities like Paul outlined here, and just think of what is your primary identity? Is it in Christ? The other point I wanted to make is that our unity in Christ is precious. We have been reconciled, and that's past tense, to God and then to one another through the death and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And so regardless of our backgrounds or various identities, we are reconciled. So ask God to show you if you are being partial or you're showing favoritism, and then repent, and God will forgive you. And then be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So again, to wrap up, we are, we are to strive to just live that out in relation to other people here in the body of Christ. We... You know, be quick to assume the best of others. Be slow to judgment. Sacrifice your own preferences for the good of the body. I asked another one of my dear friends here for input, and she said, asking for wisdom and being willing to forgive had been key for me in dealing with past racial injustice. I learned that I must forgive and trust in the Lord's wisdom and ultimate justice if I am to be obedient to the Lord. So assume the best of your brothers and sisters. So be quick to examine your own heart, knowing that our thoughts, affections, and emotions have all been corrupt, corrupted by sin. We are sinners by nature. Our hearts are deceitful. So don't follow your heart. Your cult, the culture would want you to say, just follow your heart. But don't do that. Follow <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> be quick to listen, slow to speak, test your thoughts to see if they line up with Scripture. And again, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So to wrap up one more time, true, consistent, biblical faith is evidenced by loving as God loves. Partiality is inconsistent with the example of Jesus, it's inconsistent with the grace of God, and it's inconsistent with the command to love. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for your great mercy, which is new every morning. I thank you for your word that is living and active. We truly want to be doers and not hearers only. And so, Lord, would you forgive us for the ways that we have failed to love as you have loved us? Would you open our eyes to new ways that we, we, could, that we are showing favoritism? That Would you convict us in areas where we have sinned, Lord? And we know that you are faithful and just, and you will forgive us, and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, I pray that you would now just lead us to new opportunities, ways to love others, to show mercy to others, because that is the way that you treated us. You loved us while we were still sinners. So thank you, God, for your great love for us. Help us to be more like you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.